I wanted to talk a little bit about this repertoire because it's really these unaccompanied richer cars, we don't hear them very often, and they're, they're really different than even other pieces written in the 17th century in the same city by the same composer. Um, there's something about these unaccompanied pieces that are really individualistic. Um, a big principle in the Baroque era was the idea of rhetoric, music as speech, and also gesture, bringing everything back to dance and movement of the body, because dance was such an integral part of the culture in the Baroque time period. So when we hear these pieces and we kind of think, well, where's the melody? What's going on here? You know, this doesn't sound like a gorgeous aria to me, so what does the, what's going on? Composers were really taking notes and trying to make them like speech. When we talk, we don't inflect every word exactly the same, because that would be boring. So the composers of the Baroque era were really working with the same idea that we have a group of notes here, but we're going to put a little more weight on this one, and we're going to loosen on this one, and that's going to create bigger shapes rather than trying to equalize everything out. As classical music evolved and we got into more um, really legato style singing, we moved away from this approach. But in the Baroque era, it was all about variation. How can you articulate things differently? How can you bring out certain notes and de-emphasize others to make the music more interesting? So that's really, really exemplified in these richer cars because we just have so many different characteristics and articulations we can bring out. Um, and that same thing goes with gesture. Um, the idea that a group of notes is not note, 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 but maybe it's this or maybe it's this. There's some dance move or some gesture that we're actually representing with these groups of notes. Um, for some of you who hear a lot of solo cello music, you may have noticed that my cello is actually not tuned in traditional, regular old cello tuning. Um, the top string, which is normally an A, was actually lowered down to a G for the previous set of Gabrielli Richer cards. Um, this is because back in the 17th century, um, when the cello was really just sort of coming into its own, just kind of becoming an instrument that people were writing music for, um, surprisingly, the tuning was not really standard. You know, you go to a different city and they might be tuning their cello a little bit differently, different notes. Um, there were times when composers intentionally asked, you know, I want this violin tuned with my strings, you know, totally different than normal, and they would call that scordatura. Um, what I was playing in is not actually scordatura because it's not indicated by Gabrielli anywhere. Tune your strings differently. We actually look at the manuscripts and can sort of figure out that Gabrielli was actually composing for a cello with a G string on the top instead of an A. Um, and that's because of some of the chords that he chooses that would be virtually unplayable if we had our regular A string on top. Um, and when we look further into the evidence, we see that around Gabrielli's time, the cello was just sort of still fluctuating with tunings. Just a note about unaccompanied pieces in general. Um, unaccompanied pieces are really special because they're oftentimes not written for church. They're not written for the royal court. You know, we're gonna have, for church, we're gonna have cantatas and vocal music and maybe, maybe some organ music. For the chamber, we're gonna have chamber music and we're gonna have small ensembles. But unaccompanied pieces are a really great opportunity for composers to kind of explore whatever they want at the time. Um, both Gabrielli and Antony were cellists, and I think that is especially important because they can sit down at their cello and say, what, am I, how, what boundaries am I going to push today? What am I going to try out today? And that's what we really see in these pieces. Even with J.S. Bach, we know all of his great sacred music, all the great passions, um, even the cello suites, lots of you know, really wonderful music that we know. When we listen to these keyboard music, solo keyboard music, it's almost like we're listening to a different guy sometimes. You can imagine Bach sitting down and saying, this isn't for work, this isn't for some job assignment, this is for me right now. And sitting down and some of Bach's wildest works are solo keyboard works and you can just imagine him sitting down and really pushing the boundaries. And I think that's exactly what these unaccompanied pieces are all about. Kind of these cellists fooling around with, what can I do? I'm not doing this for anyone but myself. And I really enjoy that aspect, and I think for the performer, you know, when we play chamber music, we play with other people, it's so fun because it's a dialogue and it's a conversation and we're telling a story with the help of other musicians. But when we have unaccompanied pieces, we're all by ourselves. So in some ways it's a monologue or a soliloquy, but it's also just a way to think of an inner dialogue. 
you're thinking one thing and then you're thinking another. You're, you know, anytime you're in distress, your brain is a lot of different things at once. And I think these pieces really capture that inner dialogue and that sort of inner emotional struggle because this music, it's not coming off of anyone else. It's not really responding to anyone else. It's only responding to itself. And I think that's what makes these pieces so special and why I personally really enjoy playing them.